Okay, I'm a little hoarse because I've got a little virus, but I'm uh, going to talk to you about managing food allergies today. And currently there are two uh, strategies that are um, being used at least fairly widely to manage food allergies. So the main strategy that's being used and has been used for um, uh, decades is allergen avoidance. So this just involves avoiding the allergen or allergens of concern. Um, with periodic retesting to reassess to see whether or not the patient has developed a natural tolerance, which can actually happen for some allergens fairly frequently. Okay, the second management approach is oral immunotherapy, which is also known as oral desensitization. So, we're going to start by just talking about avoidance, and in avoiding the food allergen, you have to be familiar with and comfortable reading product labels. So. If you have a known food allergy, you should read all product labels carefully before purchasing or consuming any item. And under current regulations from the FDA that were enacted in 2006, okay, they were enacted in 2006, um, the Food Allergy and Consumer Protection Act, major allergens including milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, um, and they must specify which type of tree nut, fish and crustaceans, so they must specify which type, have to be labeled on the package. So it's noteworthy that labeling of seeds and mollusks uh, shellfish are not required under current law. How the package is labeled um, may depend a little bit on the individual packaging. So it has to be labeled in plain language, um, and this can be um, uh, listed directly in the ingredients here. For example, in the top label, you can see that non-fact milk is listed as an ingredient. Um, uh, among some other allergens, which I can't read as well from this angle. Um, whereas underneath, um, <clears throat> uh, it's listed in the ingredient list, but also um, noted separately as containing a common allergen there on the bottom, containing peanut ingredients. Okay, so there are guidelines out there to help you read food packaging um, more efficiently. Um, Fair, whose representative is here tonight, has very nice guidelines on reading packaging for very common food, for the common food allergens. Um, these guides are helpful and they may reveal some unexpected sources of um, the allergen. For instance, um, with the labeling for soy here, they mentioned that soy may sometimes be contained in um, uh, some ingredients that may be a little unexpected, such as um, can't read it too well from this angle, and it's too small here. So um, starches, for example, um, uh, let's see, oh wait, this is wheat. What did you do with my soy, Mary Claire? <laughs> um, so this is not the original one that I had up here because I had some better examples of unexpected sources. But uh, for wheat here, for example, um, soy sauce may um, uh, contain wheat and that may be a little bit unexpected. So. Okay, so um, there may be some derivatives of uh, the food that do not contain uh, typically high levels of the allergen. For example, some food oils, for example, so soy oil is often refined to a point that it has very little protein in it, and many patients may be able to tolerate it, but it's impossible to make universal recommendations about that. Okay. So... Um, one thing that comes up often in our clinics when talking with families is how to read packaging for cross-contamination of uh, uh, foods. So it's important to understand that under current regulations, um, cross-contamination is not required to be indicated on foods. So only ingredients that are actually part of the food need to be labeled. So advisory labeling regarding cross-contamination at this point is completely voluntary and not regulated. There's no meaning behind the phrases may contain, manufactured on shared equipment with, etc., in terms of the amount of food protein that may be potentially contaminating these products. In fact, um, many food products that are not labeled as being potentially cross-contaminated um, may be cross-contaminated. So in one survey um, where uh, it looked at 17% of supermarket products, um, uh, 17% of them were labeled as being potentially cross-contaminated. <clears throat> However, um, uh, in the, some surveys, 5.3% of foods that are labeled as potentially being cross-contaminated um, were found to contain detectable contaminants, and 
even up to maybe 2% of foods that were not labeled as being potentially cross-contaminated had some detectable contamination. So this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be enough contamination that it's going to cause the problems for lots of people, but it may cause the problems for some. Okay. Um, it's important to know that in studies where they've looked at cross-contamination, some um, allergens are more likely to be found in foods as cross-contaminants than others. For example, the food manufacturing um, industry seems to be more careful about peanuts, um, and products that are labeled as potentially cross-contaminated with peanuts tend to be cross-contaminated less frequently than foods that are labeled as potentially cross-contaminated with milk, and those foods tend to be uh, contain detectable milk protein at higher rates. Um, in terms of choosing foods from manufacturers, um, contamination seems to be more common in manufacturers from, uh, from small manufacturers than in uh, larger manufacturers. So in one survey, we looked at food products from uh, small manufacturers, up to 5% were uh, contaminated with common food allergens versus 0.75% uh, from large uh, manufacturers. And so... Uh, I generally don't take a universal approach to counseling patients on um, how to approach uh, cross-contamination. It has to be kind of um, individualized to their own patient's allergens and their own history of uh, reactions and exposures. Okay. So what about incidental contact with food allergens? This is something that comes up fairly often in our clinics as well. So um, skin contact is uh, very unlikely to result in a systemic reaction or anaphylaxis to a food allergen, but very commonly does result in a rash or hives. So in one study where patients with a known peanut allergy were exposed to peanut intentionally on their skin, about 50% of people had a reaction on their skin. So it was fairly common. But none of those patients had any more severe reactions or any more severe symptoms. Okay. It's important to know, too, that when thinking about incidental contact and skin contact, most uh, cleaning agents and soaps are able to adequately remove um, uh, contaminated proteins from surfaces, if you're concerned about that. Um, it is important to know, though, that using hand gels and things to remove potential contamination from hands will not do so. So you need to use um, soap and water to wash uh, contaminants off of hands. Okay. And thinking about allergens, potentially incidental contact through the air, um, incidental contact due to dust from most allergens or um, scents from most allergens are very unlikely to cause significant reactions to the food allergens. So in one study where patients were um, intentionally exposed to or asked to sniff peanuts or peanut dust, I'm oh, sorry, peanut uh, butter, um, uh, none of the patients had uh, a reaction. Um, so this doesn't mean that reactions aren't possible, um, just that they are very infrequent and very uncommon. So in some cases um, uh, where there may be more aerosolization of the food, um, potentially through food that's being cooking, so smoke where food is being fried, or potentially in steam where food is being steamed, or where the food is being intensely uh, uh, mechanically processed, so um, active food processor or manufacturing facilities, there may be more antigen in the air. And in these cases, patients may have uh, reactions to the aerosolized antigen. Typically, they are limited to respiratory um, uh, reactions, so asthma symptoms are wheezing, in patients that are known to be more sensitive. Okay. So how do you handle eating out and restaurants? So reactions due to cross-contamination in restaurants are fairly common, and they're more common in some restaurant and food environments than others. So the settings that have been most commonly associated with um, uh, reactions uh, in restaurants and food environments include ice cream parlors, bakeries, and uh, Asian food restaurants where a lot of the common food allergens are common ingredients. So consumers should clearly communicate their allergies to the restaurant staff. So rather than asking, you know, what's actually in the, what are the ingredients in this dish, convey that your child has an allergy to peanuts and that it is potentially severe and could result in anaphylaxis. Um, make sure that you ask the restaurant staff about uh, checking with the kitchen to see if there is any risk for potential cross-contamination in the kitchen and to be aware of that um, when choosing menu items. Even if the ingredients are listed on the menu, you should double check with the restaurant staff and confirm that there isn't you know, a risk of cross-contamination or that maybe somehow the food allergen was missed in the list of ingredients. And then last, you should be cautious about foods that are 
cooked in environments or cooked in mechanisms where they may be more likely to be cross-contamination. Uh, so foods that are cooked in deep fryers, uh, drinks and things that are made in blenders, etc. Okay. So that covers kind of the classic way that we manage food allergies in terms of food avoidance. I'm now going to talk some about oral immunotherapy or oral desensitization. So um, <clears throat> uh, some of you may be familiar with this already, and that patients begin consumption of their food and slowly increase the amount of food allergen they're ingesting over the time. So the rationale to use the oral route in this desensitization uh, protocol has been due to the fact that uh, consumption normally produces tolerance in young children and in lab animals where it's been studied. So at this point, it's not recommended as part of routine care in the U.S. Uh, food allergy guidelines. It's also not recommended um, uh, as routine care in the uh, Japanese guidelines, but both the Japanese and the European guidelines say that it can be considered at centers with immunotherapy experience and expertise in treating anaphylaxis. So I'm not going to talk about any oral immunotherapy protocols in detail, but just to give you some idea of uh, the basic uh, structure of oral immunotherapy um, uh, dosing and maintenance. Typically, patients start off with a very slow dose of the food protein, so approximately um, 3 to 6 milligrams, um, which if you're talking about peanuts, is about 1 one-hundredth of a peanut. In clinic, the dose is typically increased every one to two weeks under an observed environment. Um, and this is increased with the goal of reaching a maintenance dose that varies widely from protocol to protocol. So in some protocols, the maintenance dose may be as low as 300 milligrams, which is approximately a peanut, maybe a little bit more. And in some protocols, uh, maybe up to 4 grams of food protein daily, which may be up to about 16 peanuts or a full serving of peanut butter. Um, under most protocols, people will take a daily dose of OIT, so you are required to take a dose every day. But the truth is it's not really known what the minimum maintenance dose for OIT is. And in some studies, it's been less frequent. So some studies have used maintenance doses that may only be a few times a week. The goal of oral um, desensitization or oral immunotherapy protocols um, is somewhat different from protocol to protocol. So some protocols have the goal of a low maintenance dose with preventing uh, ingestion of cross-contamination and preventing accidental uh, reactions that may occur that way. Some protocols have the goal of getting people up to a full maintenance dose so they may be able to sit down and eat some of the food um, for which they're being desensitized to. Um, oral immunotherapy and oral desensitization has been done for multiple foods, and the Sean Parker Center here uh, at Stanford was one of the first centers to do that. Okay, so what are the side effects of oral immunotherapy? oral desensitization. So the common side effects include um, oral discomfort, um, gastrointestinal pain or an upset stomach, um, uh, and wheezing. So the risk of these reactions with any <clears throat> home dose may be even up to 3.5 percent in some studies. There may be other side effects that are less acute. So some patients may have their atopic dermatitis flare during um, oral immunotherapy. Um, less common but still frequent are um, more severe reactions, including uh, potentially whole body hives or anaphylaxis, and it's been estimated at least one out of ten patients in many of the studies that have been done using oral immunotherapy may have a reaction that requires treatment with epinephrine during the course of their therapy. Um, other side effects that have been reported include eosinophilic esophagitis, which we talked a little bit about as an inflammation of the esophagus. It's not really... Uh, understood exactly what percentage of people may suffer from uh, um, eosinophilic esophagitis. In most studies, it's been estimated to be under 5 percent, but a lot of studies also have not looked very carefully at, amongst these patients with abdominal pain, how many of them are actually having eosinophilic esophagitis or um, other eosinophilic inflammation in the gut. Because of side effects, dropouts in the studies have been fairly common, uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. So. Okay. Side effects with oral immunotherapy may also be more common in the setting of children with infections or in uh, children uh, taking a dose of their oral immunotherapy and then exercising shortly afterwards. Okay. So what are some of the other uh, shortcomings in terms of oral immunotherapy and what we know about it to date? So um, some patients aren't able to achieve their goal dosing. So um, because of side effects or um, because the patients are not cooperative with their dosing, they're not able to get up to their goal dosing. Um, if doses in oral immunotherapy are missed, patients are at an increased risk for a reaction. There probably is a window where they have some protection and are able to skip some doses or decrease their doses, but there is an increased risk of a reaction still. 
in studies where people have looked at uh, rates of long-term uh, non-responsiveness, or sustained unresponsiveness, um, the rates of sustained responsiveness are actually not that high. So in a lot of the studies where people have looked, and people have been on therapy for a period of months or even up to a couple of years, um, in a lot of the studies, the sustained unresponsiveness after people have been off the therapy for a period of weeks to months is often only 20 or 30 percent. So there have been some studies that suggest that it may be higher if they're on oral immunotherapy longer, um, but it's still at this point a question in terms of what, if anything, could be modified about the protocols um, to make more patients have a longer or, or have a sustained unresponsiveness. And that's the point of a lot of oral immunotherapy trials that are going on across the country now. Um, from many of the studies that were done early looking at sustained unresponsiveness, um, it's a little bit of a challenge to know how effective the oral immunotherapy was um, because it was done in studies where there wasn't a placebo arm um, or the food allergies weren't necessarily confirmed with the challenge before the challenge was done and before the oral immunotherapy was started. And so it's a little bit difficult to know how many of those children would have outgrown their um, food allergies on their own and how many of them would not have reacted to the challenge when they even started the oral immunotherapy. So, oops. Okay. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about some uh, future developments of food allergy therapy. And uh, oral immunotherapy is being practiced in the community now. There are um, offices out there that are doing it. Here at Stanford, it's only being offered um, as part of clinical trials at the Sean Ann Parker Center. Um, and if some of you are considering oral immunotherapy um, and uh, considering doing it with a community practitioner in the area, there are some things that you may want to consider. So one, what's the provider availability? We've just talked about the fact that side effects with oral immunotherapy are very common and people are going to react to the therapy as the doses are being increased or even if they're on their maintenance dose and say they develop a cold. So how available is your provider to answer questions or deal with problems that come up after hours on weekends or for emergencies? Um, at this point, um, it's still not real clear um, for a lot of offices how we're going to build insurance and things for oral immunotherapy. It doesn't fall under a lot of our classic um, kind of allergy treatments at this point. Some people have found some workarounds around that, but in some cases it may actually be a, a fairly expensive out-of-pocket expense, especially if you're using some of the adjunctive medications that are really very unlikely to be covered by insurance. Okay, so it's good to get a sense of the experience of the providers. How much, um, how many patients they treated with oral immunotherapy. Um, much of the practicalities of oral immunotherapy, particularly how doses are adjusted if people are sick, how many doses you may be able to miss before you have an increased risk of a reaction and things, are not very well published. And so a lot of those decisions are really made by providers and uh, uh, based on their experience. Um, okay. And then to remember that um, in many cases, if people are going to choose oral immunotherapy, it may be a commitment to a lifelong allergen dosing. So um, uh, as I said before, when patients have tried to stop in a lot of the studies, it is only uh, uh, maybe 20 to 30 percent in a lot of the studies that may have a long-term unresponsiveness. So in many of the studies that have been done and, and follow-up for some of the studies that have been done that haven't been published, um, a lot of the patients actually end up stopping oral immunotherapy because they um, become tired with the dosing on a daily basis. So.